Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today is Monday, September 14th, 2020. In today's podcast, I'm joined once again by Emily Oster to finally talk about the do's and don'ts of pregnancy. Emily and I were originally scheduled to talk about this topic for the inaugural Healthful Woman Podcast this past spring, but since Corona took over the world at the same time, Emily and I spoke about COVID-19 instead. So I'm really excited to finally discuss pregnancy with Emily. She's the author of Expecting Better, which is my favorite book on pregnancy. There are so many misconceptions out there regarding recommendations for pregnant women. Emily and I discuss a bunch of them in this podcast. Some of them may actually surprise you. I've also written about this topic, and you can find a copy of my article on this online at my main practice website, www.mfmnyc.com. On Thursday, I'm joined by Michelle Santoyo to discuss another common topic in pregnancy, induction of labor. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Okay, we're here with Dr. Emily Oster. Welcome back to Healthful Woman. So happy you could join us again. Thanks for having me again. Wonderful. And as we were talking about before, we're going to talk about something other than the coronavirus because, you know, that's so old news. We're tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's taken over everyone's lives. But, you know, listen, as, as I know from my day job, there are women who are still pregnant and they're getting pregnant and all the same questions come up. And it's important to go over that in addition to just talking about Corona. I totally agree. Yeah. One of my friends just emailed me to be like, I'm pregnant with twins. And I was like, okay, yeah, life goes on. So for our listeners, Emily Oster has been on the podcast a couple of times. You are a a writer, you're a parent, you're a PhD in economics, but the focus here is one of the books you wrote called Expecting Better, Why the Conventional Pregnancy Wisdom is Wrong and What You Really Need to Know. First in 2013 and then revised a couple times and a bigger revision expected to come out in January of 2021, correct? Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. So I'm just, just for our listeners, and how did you even get into the pregnancy writing business at at first. I mean, you're an economist. Yeah. I mean, I think the sort of short answer to that is that I I got pregnant and I was, I found myself sort of like asking a lot of the questions that I think many pregnant women ask, which are, you know, I'm trying to make some decisions about my healthcare, my behavior, you know, should I have a cup of coffee? And I am a a person who likes to to do research and I, my economic stuff is, is mostly sort of health oriented. So I found I was doing just like a tremendous amount of research into the kind of medical or public health aspects of pregnancy, kind of in service of my own pregnancy. To be frank, I got a little frustrated with a lot of the the books, a little bit with my doctor, but more just with like the the kind of books and information that was out there. And so I was, you know, one of those people was like, I'm going to write it. I'm going to do this. and I'm going to write a book. And, and then, and then I kind of, I did. It's so interesting that you said that because the way I sort of heard of you is, one of my patients said, Hey, have you heard of this book expecting better? And I, you know, I said, no, like I don't read, you know, pregnancy books that are, you know, on the sort of out there. Cause I you written know, by like, economists yeah. as you are in <laughs> fact, like an actual doctor. That's right. Fair. No. So as I said, no. And she said, I think you'll really like it because a lot of what she writes, it sort of sounds like you is what she said. And so I said, okay. So I, I read it and I was like, yeah, this is great. And then because the, the pregnancy books out there frequently are not evidence-based. They're really just someone you know, saying their opinion or saying what people have said. And if you look through them, like people say, oh, my book said this. I'm like, "Uh, no, your book's wrong. And it's unfortunate. I mean, these things are written to sell. They're not written to, you know, to give people evidence-based advice. But the fact that you did it that way was really pretty cool. And, you know, and as, you know, we've said before on the podcast, like, you know, I emailed you at lunch together, like it was, it was great. And it's been an excellent find for me, so to speak, and what a good relationship. But I'm curious what you said about that. Has, has this, given you less confidence in sort of the medical profession, the fact that it took, you know, PhD in economics to just get this right and put a good book together for pregnant women? No, I don't think so, actually. I mean, I, I think in a sense, like the the problems are not so much with the with the medical profession as with the kind of way that a lot of medical research is done, which I think you could say is the fault of, of the medical profession, but actually those are often not the same people. Right. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was, a lot of the stuff I was frustrated with was, you know, this isn't a very good public health study. 
Right. But that's not really the fault of doctors. You know, that's like that's like a fall down in the statistical training we have in, in a lot of fields. You know, and then I think the other piece that was it's sort of I- interesting to 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 think about is some of these books that I read, they it's not that they were wrong or I mean, some of them were wrong, but it's not that they were all wrong. I think that the piece that that was really frustrating was they didn't explain why. The, the thing that I try to do in the book that I I think is the more unusual piece is not so much what is the recommendation, but or you know what is the where does the data come down? But trying to help people walk through like why some data is more convincing than others, and and kind of why you'd come to these conclusions. And I think that that is something people had not tried to do. Yeah, and also I think some of it is that you know recommendations are generally very they have to be concrete, sort of black and white. You should do this. You shouldn't do this. You know, take up to this amount, but not more than this amount, because people need some guidance. Problem is, you know, the decision of where to draw the line, when to say yes, when to say no, how much to allow, how much not to allow, is not always based on well, we know that under this amount is safe and over this amount is dangerous. It's sort of like, well, we have some evidence that it might be bad, so let's just sort of pick something. But you know, for someone, for on an individual level, people might find like, well, for me this is more important to me or this is more necessary to me than somebody else. Like, for example, you know, we'll talk about like like caffeine. It's like, okay, you can tell someone don't have any caffeine. And that's fine. That's easy to say. But for someone who really doesn't have it, doesn't need it, doesn't care, that's easy. But what if someone gets horrible headaches if they don't have caffeine? So maybe their numbers should be different because they're going to sort of suffer if they don't take it. And the recommendations have a hard time with nuance. And I think that if you understand where it comes from and what is the data, what is the real risk, where are these numbers derived from, you can allow for more nuance and individualization with these recommendations. Yeah. And I think it's also helpful to pe- for people to understand, like, why are we concerned about this in the first place? And I think that's a piece that often is also not, you know, not always well explained. You know, are you worried about miscarriage? Are you worried about birth defects? Are you worried about high blood pressure? Are you worried about you getting fat? Like what, you know, what are the what exactly is the is the reason for this? And then I think that that's that's often also sort of helpful in people for people to think about kind of how does this recommendation actually apply like to me? And I'm curious. So, you you know, you wrote this book. It's it's wildly popular. You start, you know, you have a website and you have a newsletter. How much, I guess, questions are you getting people saying, hey, give me advice. What do I do? And sort of in the world of that crosses over into medical advice versus practical advice, how a how much do you get and b how do you feel about answering those kinds of questions? Yeah, I get, I mean, I get a lot, a lot of emails and I, you know, the moment I'm getting a lot of emails that are like, kind of, can you help me make this decision? Which is actually much more in my, in my space. I feel very comfortable with that, but I do get a lot of sometimes like super in the weeds, medical, de- medical questions. Like, what did you learn about this particular genetic variant? And like, d- d- which I, I have no idea about. And I will, most of the time with those, I will just tell people, look, I'm, you know, I don't, like you need to talk to your doctor about this. I don't know anything about this. Occasionally people ask me something that's like a little more general. One of the things that the book has done for many people is given them more of a like even footing to have conversations with their doctor. Mm -hmm. And so rather than, you know, not like it doesn't obviously doesn't replace the doctor, but just, you know, if I understood more about prenatal testing, it's like much easier to like sort of quickly get to like a place where we can talk about it more easily. Right. And so I think often people are asking me, basically, I was diagnosed with this. I don't really understand it. I want to understand more about it before I go like talk to my doctor about it. So sometimes I'll send them like up to date. Right. I'll send them like, you know, up to date extracts and say, look, you know, this is a little technical, but like you might, it's like the, you know, the patient information in those tends to be pretty helpful, I think. Right. Right. Up to date is a, is a website that has a lot of medical information doctors use it a lot. It's a very good uh, resource, but they also have in it sort of, this is a good summary to give to patients who aren't doctors. And so that's that's available. You, know, you have to sign up to be a member of it to have access. But yeah, that's very good. Totally on board with that. This is one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast. I don't get paid for this or anything, but it's, it's the same thing. If someone is about to talk to me about whether they should do a CVS or amnio, like genetic testing, you know, there's amount of background information they might not have. And in order to have a more high level conversation, if they come in with more knowledge about it, it'll, we'll have more time to talk about it. So for example, they could, you know, listen to the podcast and then come talk about it and it'll be a much more productive conversation. And I do think your book has opened that up for a lot of women, a lot of families, which is fantastic. Do you, have you gotten pushback, you know, from doctors or whatnot saying, you know, you're in the wrong space or, you know, one of those types of things, who do you think you are? Have you gotten any of that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I got a lot of that when the book first came out. And I think, 
you know, partly because like a lot of the press we did around the, in the first part of the book was around a call and mm-hmm. sort of, like the oh, idea yeah. that you, could, you know, which like <laughs> is a whole can of worms, which we could open if we're not as you please. But, and, you know, I think it's actually a pretty small, pretty small part of the part of the book, but kind of like riled up, not so much doctors actually, but you know, the kind of like met, like the meta medical community and some advocacy groups and so on. And there I got a lot of pushback. It was like, you know, this person is not a doctor. Like, why are you listening to them? They're just some like random economist. So I, and I still get, I still get some of that. Now that I have two books, I, you know. Right. Now you're not, now you're no longer. Now I'm like, now I'm just like a writer. Right. Right. You're not a random (laughs) economist. You are a specific economist. Very specific. (laughs) How have, how have you handled, I mean, I'm just, I'm curious, just personally, you're, you're an economist, you're a PhD, you're working in a, in a university, and now you're sort of a, a national figure. How have you handled that just in general? The fame, I would say, of this. The fame, yeah. the deep, deep-seated fame of writing. Yeah. yeah. I think that you may overstate. I may be more famous in your circles than in the broader world. I will <laughs> I guess, say- I guess that's fair. Yeah. I think the piece that's still kind of weird is that is that, you know, I'm still, I mean, I, I'm a, most of the time I'm just like, a, I'm a professor and this is sort of, it's, it's become a much bigger part of my professional identity, but it's still like a little bit of a, of a side project. I mean, you're at least, you know, until, until recently gotten really involved with COVID, but like right. until recently, this was sort of more of a, of a side project. And there was this best encapsulated by this moment. So I sit on the tenure promotions committee at Brown, which is like a sort of pretty high level committee that reviews like appointments at the university level. And at some point, one of the guys that I sat on it was, was like, you know, my daughter's having a baby. I was like, oh, that's so great. Congratulations. And he was like, and I was visiting her and she said that she was reading a book by someone at Brown and it was you. And I was like, yeah, and he's like, what? he's like, what is, he was basically just like, what is that? Like, what, like, what are you doing? Yeah, why, and so I think there's like this, book? yeah, I think there's like this sort of weird separation. And sometimes I'll go do like book talks and people will be like, so like, what, like, do you still, are you still a professor? I'm like, yeah, like most of the time. And so it's just, they're so separate that it feels, it just feels like they're really separate. Right. And when you, when you're a professor, I mean, none of your courses are related to this. You don't teach a course. No, on, my yeah. research is not. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I teach. I teach a course on statistical methods it's called like applied methods, and I my research is about statistical methods and a little bit about behavior, but none of my research is about this stuff at all. It's all good. I love it. So you know, keep doing it. I I wanted to. I did want to jump into the you know some of the topics you cover in the book. Obviously, the the better thing to do is to read the book, but just to give the uh, our listeners a flavor of sort of the things you write about and you know what kind of opinions you might have. And you did organize the book sort of chronologically through pregnancy, you know, conception, first trimester, second trimester, and so forth. Which of which part of pregnancy was the hardest for you to research? Was it the early pregnancy stuff or more the labor and delivery stuff or something else? It's more the early pregnancy stuff. So I think one of the advantages of the labor and delivery stuff is a lot of the evidence is from randomized trials. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a little bit of a challenge of like figuring out which is the good trial. But like, honestly, it's not that hard because there's usually like one and it's really big and it has a special name. That piece wasn't as hard was, you know, it's still hard to write in some ways. And there was some data to produce, but it's, it was actually more straightforward. The, the early stuff is, is harder because the evidence is, is less good, more, sort of nuance, there's more issues with causality. And so that that part just took, it took longer to research, it took longer to figure out what's going on, and then it took longer to kind of figure out the right way to, to express it to people, to present it. Right. And I know you mentioned the the stuff about alcohol was pretty controversial, I guess. Was there any other aspect that either you knew up front would be you know, controversial or not well received or something that maybe surprised you? So I, this is going to sound so stupid, Nate, but like I was surprised by how people reacted to the alcohol thing <laughs> because I'm like a total dummy. And I, I, you know, and the thing is like, I knew a lot of, you know, it's like a good share of doctors who will, who will tell people it's okay to have the occasional drink. And I kind of like, those are the people that I knew. And so I was sort of surprised at like the, at the vitriol of this. I think most of the other stuff was fairly even. I didn't get a lot of pushback or at least not stuff that I was surprised by. In my own practice, I could say when I go through sort of, you know, the do's and don'ts of pregnancy in the first trimester, I can tell you that the thing that always seems to surprise patients the most when I tell them is you can eat sushi. And they're all like, what? what? And then they'll always say to me, you mean raw fish? And I'll be like, yeah, like I know what sushi is, you know, <laughs> we're talking about the same You don't thing. mean yeah. like the egg, like yeah. the weird egg thing. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's like more than any, like literally if I told them they could do crack, they'd be like, oh yeah, I get it. But like sushi, they're like, oh my God, they can't. It's like, and then so it, that's where I wanted to start. Let's start with the fish. Why does everyone freak out about fish in the first trimester? 
I guess there's like two things that people worry about. So one is that they worry about salmonella and the idea that like, you know, sushi is like this thing that makes you like really sick. And then I think, I think somehow part of it is that also sushi is sometimes these like high mercury fish. Right. And so I, I think those have been like somehow sushi has been tarred with both brushes and has just become this thing that also is just like every pregnant woman knows like, that's it. You can't have any sushi. And I think that's why people find it so surprising when you're like, no, actually like that's, you know, maybe you shouldn't eat like don't eat just like shark. Yeah. Shark is not probably not a good idea, but like some sushi is is fine. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is, is, you know, with the mercury business, it, it's totally related to the type of fish you're eating, not whether it's cooked or raw. I mean, like shark right. has high mercury, whether you, you can, you know, grill it or eat it raw, it's still going to have high mercury. You can't cook mercury out of food. And so right. other than shark and swordfish and, you know, king mackerel and that's really it. I mean, tuna has a little, so we like limit the tuna, but the raw cooked has nothing to do with it. And I, I do think there's been some, it's got conflated that someone's like, oh, since you can't eat, you know, mercury, you can't have any fish, but something like, you know, salmon and whitefish and shellfish, there's like, there's no mercury in that or almost no mercury. And so it's not really an issue. And the raw cooked is a food poisoning thing. And, you know, if you're really worried about it, you shouldn't eat it when you're not pregnant either. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the point I was I, like, having. It's like, if you think that the sushi you're eating has salmonella, like if it seems like dirty and it smells weird, like you shouldn't eat it, but like you should never eat that. Like right. you'll have your husband eat it. You know, this is like not, that's not like you should be eating. Like if you're going to eat raw fish, you should be a little more careful about where it comes from all the time. Right. And it, and it just stinks to have, you know, get food poisoning when you're pregnant. It's not like it specifically causes birth defects no, or miscarriage. Very unpleasant. Yeah. It's very and unpleasant. I, I, I always remind me when, you know, there's like a whole, you know, country where people eat sushi all the time and Japanese seem to be doing okay. And it's just like, you know, I don't know why everyone's so worried here. I, I would go to a clean place. I wouldn't eat off a street vendor. But again, I would say the same thing to anybody, not nothing to do with pregnancy. So yeah, that's really a big one in my practice. I'm, I'm like known as the guy who allows sushi as if I'm some you know, crazy <laughs> renegade. You know, got a renegade, exactly. Like this nut job. Go to the nut job and let's eat the sushi. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm gonna put my business card. Come to me. I'll let you eat sushi. Totally eat sushi. Okay. What do you tell people about deli meats? Ah, uh, so deli meats. You know, it, deli meats is interesting because the fear for deli meats is, a, is, as you know, a specific type of bacteria called listeria, and that's also why they say don't eat you know, unpasteurized dairy products. And, you know, there's various things that might have listeria. Listeria is a weird bug because it's been in so many things over the past 20 years. There was an outbreak in hummus. There was an outbreak in cantaloupes. There was an outbreak in ice Bean cream. Sprouts, yeah, ice and, cream. Yeah, and, and there was there was an outbreak in deli meat like 20 or something years ago. And so because of that, they're like, don't eat deli meat. You know, what I tell women is, number one, the chance is very, very, very low. Number two, all right, listen, maybe don't eat this stuff that's packaged and like sitting around in a supermarket shelf for six months. Like, all right, get fresh deli, you know, like sliced pastrami or something, and that should be fine. And if someone's really, you know, they love it, but they just want to be a little bit extra paranoid, which is fine, God bless, like microwave it or heat it. And if it, it. And if it's hot, then the bug's killed. But I don't discourage people from eating proper deli sandwich, you know, corned beef on rye. Like that's the chance again, listeria is really no different from anywhere else. I tell people, if you hear on the news, there's an outbreak of listeria and something, listen, you know, find out what it's in and don't eat that. But it's otherwise, it's really not such a big issue. And the thing I was gonna get back to also, which is true sometimes for meat and sometimes for the sushi is, you know, sometimes the people who say, oh, I want to be extra cautious, it can actually be counterproductive because fish are so good for you, you know, in life and in pregnancy. And if someone's like, well, yeah, my the way I eat fish in my diet is through sushi, and then they stop eating it, it's probably bad that they stopped eating sushi, not just neutral. And so it's something if they if they want to be cautious, all right, eat cooked salmon, but you know, fish is good for you. And so people have right. to be careful that their paranoias are not being counterproductive. If it's a paranoia that's harmless, you know, God bless, we all have them. But it's it's important not to go overboard with these things. When expecting matter first came out, somebody wrote something that was like, you know, you say like deli meats are no are no like are are okay and the risk of getting listeria is very low, but like I got listeria. And I, I miscarried, which of course is like, you know, can happen and is, is tragic. It wasn't, they didn't get it from belly means they got it from something else. But then they they said, you know, in my, in my second pregnancy, like it, it is important not to tell people they can take chances. In my second pregnancy, I only ate packaged foods. Like I only ate like, pa you know, packaged Doritos and like, but like, that's also not, you no, know, that's also not good for you. But a, that isn't a, the a reaction. full diet of Doritos and bottled water. Yeah. Like that isn't the reaction you want to have either. So there's a sort of like tension between kind of in the effort to be careful, you may actually like take some other kinds of risks. Right. And I think that 
alcohol is a little bit different. I definitely want to talk about that because what basically you concluded in your book, which is basically what all the evidence shows, is that we know that high amounts of alcohol are bad for the baby. Don't do that. But there's a ton of evidence that a very small amount of alcohol and what defines very small, we can get into, has no long-term or short-term effects on the babies. And you said, so fine. And that's what it is. And I think people went nuts over that. And I think that part of it is because the party line, like if you look at the national societies, like the American College of OBGYN and you know, all these people that put out recommendations, they say, we know that that's the case. But since there's really no upside to alcohol, you should have none during pregnancy. And so that's sort of the recommendation on the books is no alcohol during pregnancy, but that's mostly because there's no known benefit to it, not because anyone thinks that taking a half glass of wine a week is going to cause great harm. I think that's right. The, the response to this struck me as a little bit, it had a lot of different different pieces. And so I think there, you know, there were definitely people who took issue with the evidence, either in ways that I thought were were a little bit confusing. So there were the people who would cite studies to me that like either were just made up or didn't really have any you know, any like strong basis in, in reality. And I think that always, you always get some of that, you know, and then there were, there were kind of, there was a lot of pushback just around people saying, you know, look, we can't tell people, even if we all agree that having a little bit is fine. If we tell women that they can have one, like a little bit of alcohol, they'll have a lot. And it's better to just, you know, tell them not to have any, because we know that not having any is safe. And we know that having a lot is risky. And, you know, if we give them a little bit of permission, they'll kind of go, they'll go too far. So I actually heard, I heard that reaction, like quite a lot from a policy standpoint, which I think is a sort of slightly complicated, um, it's a little disrespectful, but also a sort of complicated, even from a policy. Right, from right. Because it, be, it may be the opposite. It may be if you only give people two choices and one choice is zero and the other choice is whatever, then they won't realize that, you know, there's a difference between having a half glass of wine a week or three glasses a day. Right. And so if, unless you put that out, I, you know, that what I typically get is, you know, the, the data is, is actually is a lot of data. I mean, they've done long-term studies. They look at kids when they're age seven, age 10, age 15. And basically in all of these studies, when women drink, you know, what's called less than a certain amount, it typically that ends up being about less than one drink a day or nine drinks a week, somewhere in that yeah, range. Something in that range. Yeah. Yep. It depends on the study. They've never found any adverse effects on the baby slash child when the woman drinks less than that amount. So, which is great. I mean, that's like really good evidence in that sense. And what some people will say, well, okay, you know, maybe there's like, instead of the IQ being 120, it's going to be 118. Or maybe instead of, you know, getting into X college, they'll get into one less college. And that's not something you could tease out in a study. And I tell you, that's possible. I mean, theoretically it's possible, but it's not really known to be like that with any other teratogen, you know, bad thing in pregnancy type of thing. So it just doesn't make sense to me. And so what I what I tell women is we know that high amounts are bad. Everything that we've seen shows us that low amounts are good. And I ask, like, what are we talking about here? And she goes, well, I want to have a half, half a glass of wine with dinner every three weeks. I'll be like, all right, you know, like, can I promise you 1000% there's zero risk? No, but basically everything we know says there's no risk to that. I don't have an issue with it. I tell them the party line is not to have any. I, I, I tell them what is recommended, but I tell them I don't think it's a big deal in that sense. And again, people, they, they still don't seem to be bothered with that as much as they are with the fish. <laughs> Somehow it must be that people get like very strong cravings for something like that. And you just like can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> Your analysis, the alcohol was very reasoned. It was reasonable. And I think it's it. And the people who write about this, even the ones who make the rec recommendations, don't even disagree with you. They say, yeah, that's what it is. But either because the reason you said that it's just not wise or because we can't prove for sure, there's no tiny effect or just because they think it's not worth it. For whatever reason, everyone sort of just has no alcohol whatsoever. And again, I think most women are fine with that. And they're just like, you know what, I don't need to deal with this. But some, it's it's important to them for whatever reason, either from a social reason, sometimes a religious reason. I know like in my religion, you know, there's wine in certain, you know, ceremonies or for just it, it helps them feel relaxed, they, you know, whatever. It's And that's, I, I try not to make people feel too guilty over these things because the the vast, you know, overwhelming likelihood is it's not going to be an issue. Yeah. I also think there's this, there's a sort of complicated messaging piece here, which, which is like, you know, we're sort of messaging, we're sending this message. And I think the message is going to, 
is being listened to by sort of certain people and who are already probably taking a lot of other precautions and sort of thinking carefully about this and doing all kinds of other stuff. And the message is probably going, is, is not going as much to, to groups that maybe need to hear it more. So I actually think a fair amount of the sort of very problematic alcohol exposure happens before people know they're pregnant, people right. who got pregnant. Like it, like basically didn't realize they were pregnant, weren't trying to get pregnant, was accidental. You know, they they're drinking a lot in the first weeks. They don't find out until a bit late. And so, you know, those the kind of you can say whatever you want about alcohol and pregnancy. If a lot of the exposure is happening before people know they're pregnant, then you know that's not those messaging. The messaging is not very helpful. How was your research on caffeine? Were you surprised by by any of that compared to the messaging that you got when you were pregnant? Yeah, I mean, so the messaging about caffeine was in some ways, like it was more, con- so the message of alcohol, I didn't necessarily agree with, but at least it was very consistent. The message of my caffeine was like every book said a different thing. Right. It was like some, some is like, no, no coffee at all. Some is like, well, two cups is fine. Some is like three cups is fine. You know, one cup is fine. They make sure you measure how big it is, you know? And, and so always when you come across those kind of things, you got to wonder like, what the, where is this coming from? Because it seems really not like you guys must all not be reading the same pieces of information. And, you know, I think that, that with caffeine, it was very helpful to kind of take a step back and say, OK, like, what are you worried about? OK, well, we're worried about miscarriage primarily. Right. But that's a big one, because what you said before, people don't always know what we're worried about. They think right. like alcohol, you're not worried about miscarriage. You're worried about, you know, like birth defect or brain development. But caffeine, it's not that. It's you're not worried about any of that. You're just worried about maybe it's going to cause a miscarriage. So that's a different outcome. And that also, you know, that has sort of implications for how you think about, you know, the third trimester is very different from the first trimester right. in that um, in that standpoint. I mean, really, we're talking in the caffeine about the the first the first trimester. Right. This is a place where I got you kind of like totally geek out as a person who likes causality because actually. Like, you know, one problem is that with all the data is that, you know, women who drink a lot of caffeine tend to be older. And so they're more likely to miscarry right. for that reason. But that's not so interesting. That's only like moderately interesting. But then there's actually this this confound with nausea. Right. Which is that, you know, women who are nauseous are, are less likely to miscarry. It's just for various reasons. It appears right. to be correlated with continuation of, of pregnancy. But they're also much less likely to have coffee because coffee is like not appealing if you are about to vomit all the time. Right. And so you actually end up seeing it's sort of like the nausea that's kind of correlated with both of these things. It's not obvious there's kind of any link at more or less at any level between caffeine and and miscarriage. Right. And in the study, yeah, in the studies, you'd have to have mega doses of caffeine to slightly increase your risk. I mean, you're talking like eight, nine TED cups a day in order to even like slightly increase your risk of miscarriage. No, people, people are like, there. you know, is it okay? Like, I'd like to have a half a cup of coffee with a, like a lot of milk. And so these people write me that, like you said, you know, I can't, I can't, I feel really would just love to have a half a cup of coffee with a lot of milk in the morning. I'm like, oh my God, yes. Like, no, like, no, yes, of course. Like you should definitely do that. Right. And isn't this sort of the, the area with the nausea and the caffeine where you threw your mother-in-law under the bus? I'm sure there's many areas where I threw my mother-in-law <laughs> under the bus. My mother-in-law is a wonderful lady. She's actually downstairs in my house right now taking care of my kids. But she was actually very nauseous. And she was very sick when she was pregnant. Mm. Um, okay. And she also has a lot of crazy theories about data. What are you telling people or what did you tell people about cats and gardening and toxoplasma? So there's this concern with cats that you will have toxoplasmosis, which is uh, which can cause some significant problems. And, it, you know, it is true that cats can have that. But, it, you know, it turns out actually like having a cat is not a, is not particularly linked to having this in pregnancy. I think partly because people are often exposed earlier and partly because it's mostly if your cat is eating a lot of raw outdoor meat, that actually there is some sort of elevated risk in sort of outdoor yard work gardening of, of this particular. I mean, it's still small. These are, you know, this is a relatively small risk. When you spoke about the or wrote about the second trimester stuff, things you put in, I really loved. One of them was this idea of you're not eating for two. And the second thing was about exercise. And I'm a big fan of keeping your weight in check as best as you can and exercising a lot. And did you did you find a lot of data on this or just that, you know, there's no data that it's harmful, so you should just do what's healthy? There is some data on the exercise piece where, you know, again, this is a place where you want to kind of like figure out, okay, like, what are you worried about, right? So I think something people are worried about is like, if I, you know, if I run, like the baby will fall out or something. That's not the way it works. So, you know, you could sort of like the basic biology would tell you that, you know, that's okay. And then, you know, and then with, with people, I mean, I was I like, I do a lot of running. And so I was like particularly interested in the, in the running piece. And they've actually done these things with like elite athletes looking at, you know, how is the blood flow to the placenta compromised when you're like really running hard, you know, not like 
out for a like totally jog, but you know, like really like trying to train for something. And, you know, there's kind of short term, like, you know, in the, in the sort of short term, in the most extreme moments, your, the blood flow is slightly lower to the, to the baby, but doesn't seem to be like, not in a way that's like clinically relevant. And so I thought that was, you know, that, that's something like in some ways we were able to measure pretty well. There is this issue. I don't know how much you like that people's sort of ligaments get a little bit, get a bit looser. Yeah. Yeah. And that you can then get which I definitely, I guess, so at the end of my second pregnancy, I, I like pulled a hamstring. There's also an issue with people's balance is different and their whole center of gravity is different. So people who run or do sort of exercises, a lot of movement, they tend to move a little bit differently when they're pregnant for many reasons, which makes sense. And the second thing is the joints become a little bit more lax. And so there, there is a slightly higher risk of injury from, you know, pulled things and strained things and not so much like broken things unless you fall. But those things do happen. And so we tell people to be a little careful about that. Same thing with people do a lot of yoga. Sometimes they have to be more careful when they're pregnant because they can, you know, stretch more than they normally would. And sometimes they can overdo it. But again, that's more of like a, a musculoskeletal type thing. It's not really, they're not hurting the baby from it. It's, it's not about the baby. Yeah. No, it's just, I just couldn't yeah. walk. Like, yeah, I, you know, that, I like pulled a hamstring happens. at like 37 weeks. It was like right. Really I remember, you know, 37 weeks, you know, you're jet, most people at that point are 20 to 40 pounds heavier. Their center of gravity is different. They're going to walk differently. They're going to run differently. And it, it could be simply just that, but certainly it could also be an issue with the joints themselves. And then I, I know probably you could write an entire book on this, but what did you find when you're looking up the idea of medications in pregnancy? You sort of put that in the middle of the book. And it's, it's again, you could write a thousand page book just on medications in pregnancy and how like crazy poor the data is on that. But what, what did you find? I mean, I think mostly that the data is terrible. I mean, that's like that sort of headline results here was just that the data that we have on this is absolutely awful. It's interesting the reasons kind of why it's so bad, which is basically because we are trying to protect pregnant women by not doing studies on them. So, you know, we don't want to include them in their studies because of course, like then they might be injured. But and, and that, you know, that's considered unethical. There's actually some ethics people have now argued, look, it's actually unethical not to do this. Right. You know, like when we don't evaluate, you know, we don't test SSRIs in, in pregnant women. Well, now, like, there are a lot of pregnant women who need to, you know, have been relying on antidepressants who feel like maybe this is not safe to take. That's, that's an ethical issue. Notoriously, pregnant women and children are excluded from studies. And the problem is there are pregnant women and children who we need to know what to do with them. And so what I mean, I don't know why it's the the fear that researchers have is they have to there's so much more regulation that comes into place in their study if there's a fetus involved, because, you know, anytime you do a study where you're doing something experimental, there has to be like a, an oversight on safety. And that's very, very hard to do. But if you're like, OK, I've got a person he or she can come in, we can look, we can do a blood test, we can evaluate them, decide if everything is safe and move on. How do you evaluate the safety of the fetus? Like, who's going to do that? Are you going to do it during pregnancy? I can do it after birth. I mean, who's You're responsible? For like 15 years. What if it's later? Like, who, you know, who's, yeah. It's almost just not worth it for the researchers. Even Forget about the ethics of it. They're just like, I can't do this. It's just not possible. It's too much work. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, you know, in the end, when you come down with the drugs, there's basically a few things that kind of seem like they're pretty safe. Some antibiotics, which, you know, I think we've decided we have to evaluate things like, you know, folic acid, Tylenol, like some sort of basic stuff that is kind of categorized as pretty safe. There's a few things that are just totally off limits, like Accutane. And like, you know, I said, I said, I can never say the, the generic for that. But yeah. I so there are a few things that are totally, yeah. yeah, exactly. So a few things are totally off, off limits. And then most stuff is in this kind of category, like, vague intermediate category where like basically we don't have any evidence to suggest that it's bad and we don't have sufficient evidence to suggest that it's okay. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you mentioned like SSRIs and this is something that, you know, we talk and about this come up time. for you guys all the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the problem is, you know, and then people have tried to study this. I mean, obviously there's a lot of people who want to know the answer, but you know, the best way to do this is to take, you know, let's say 10,000 women randomly, you know, divide them into two groups, give 5,000 of them, let's say, you know, Prozac, and the other 5,000 give a drug that looks just like Prozac, but has nothing in it. Nobody knows who's taking what. And then you follow them through the pregnancy. And then after birth, you do like 10 years of neurologic testing on the babies. You'll look for birth defects, brain development, this, that. So that's a hard study to do for a lot of reasons. One, it's expensive. Two, it's very hard to just tell people I'm going to randomly give you Prozac or not. Like that's not what happens in the world. So what they do is they look back at 5,000 women who took Prozac and they compare them to 5,000 who didn't. And there's a lot of problems with that, as you know. One is they're not the same at baseline. The group who takes Prozac 
is probably more likely to be older. There's probably a higher proportion of women in there who may be smoking or drinking or have other health issues. And so any difference you see could be due to that. And the other issue is when we have women around Prozac, we test their babies more. So if you t- if you find a little tiny hole in the baby's heart after birth, right. you may not have even checked in the other women. And so you don't know if it's really a higher rate. And so, and the studies, the, the risk of like birth defects, it's, you're talking about like 1%. And so I tell women, listen, the risk is probably up to 1%, but maybe zero. We just don't know. And if you don't take it, you may have other problems. And so it, it ends up being, I think, almost... I don't know, counterproductive to have these studies that show some possible risk when it's really unclear and the benefit is huge. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people are sort of left in this position where it's like, I really like it sort of sometimes you're like, well, you should take it if you really feel like you need it, you know, which kind of leaves women to say, I mean, not that you would say that, but I think that that is the message that women sometimes at least hear and sort of like, well, I don't like, I, I do need it, but like, I don't, you know, I'm not at the, I don't want to risk my baby and somehow like implying the, like, are you like, are you too weak right. that you, you know, you have to take this even though it's bad for your baby. And I think that's, that's right. a very tricky. Yeah. And, and yeah, if, if, if we end up saying something that sort of either truly does or makes a woman think that we're pitting her against her baby, that's a bad situation because, that's very bad. And, it, and it's also not even true because usually what's good for her is good for the baby and vice versa. So you know, what I tell women about SSRIs, you know, sort of generally is the only people who really should stop it before pregnancy or during pregnancy are people really, they never need it. Like someone got prescribed 20 years ago. They don't even know why, you know, right, they're, they're on like, like a super low dose. Yeah. And, just and, like, I tell them, yeah. and I usually tell them, listen, maybe speak to your psychiatrist, whoever gives it to you, try to go off it before pregnancy, see how you do. If you're basically the same, fine. If like, if you're a wreck, then no, you should be on it because not eating right, not sleeping right. All those things are also a problem in pregnancy potentially. And so most women who are on it need to be on it. And there are some that don't, but it's generally, I would say that's the exception in my, at least in my experience of women I see, you know, others may have different uh, patient populations. I don't know. I'm assuming that you went into the data on bed rest. It it made smoke come out of your ears. I mean, that was the place where I couldn't like I, you know, something like 20 percent of women are prescribed some kind of bed. I mean, it's a really big number. Right. Right. And you sort of and then I was like, yeah, like, OK, like, let me think about like, what are the things that you might be prescribed bed rest for? And it's like everything, you know, it's like pre- suspected preterm labor, you know, like there's like a lot of different stuff that they that they prescribe bed rest for. And and it it then the, the, it's not useful for any of them. Right. That basically for almost no situation, is it a good idea to prescribe people bed rest? I just couldn't quite understand like what, honestly, just like what was going on there. I mean, I guess I then it sort of dig in, you kind of understand what's happening, which is like, you know, for, for a large, you know, good share of women who go into preterm labor. So they have some like, you know, kind of threatened labor early on that then stops for good share of them. Everything goes fine. And, you know, they make it to term or close to term. And so if you put them on bed rest, like most of the time they will do fine. Right. And so then that like reinforces, I think, in the mind of, of them, but also of their doctor, like, OK, well, that was a good idea. Right. Seemed like a good idea. If you just like lay down, stop doing so much, maybe the baby will, you know, stay in there. Oh, and then it worked. OK, next time I'm going to feel, you know, compelled to do the same thing again. And then, you know, what we get from the randomized trials is like, yeah, that's true that that, you know, they didn't go into preterm labor, but neither did the people who we let walk around. Right. And I think somehow then that finding has was not as quickly as it might have been sort of translated into nobody should be on bed rest. It sort of somehow got stuck in like we're still prescribing this a lot. I don't know. I mean, you must have some instinct about why why that's such an appealing it's, thing. It's an amazing thing. I mean, I did my fellowship, you know, 12 to 15 years ago. And during that time, I did a survey on this, which is actually the data you're talking about of how many people prescribe bed rest. One of those is one of the studies I wrote about this. And this is 15 years ago. And back then, we all knew the same thing. Bed rest doesn't work, right? And the data was exactly as clear then as it is now. And we knew this, but a lot of people were prescribing it. So I was like, all right, let's send a survey. And we surveyed, you know, like, I think it was like 900, you know, maternal fetal medicine specialists. These are like high risk doctors, the, you know, the highest trained obstetricians in the, com- in the country. And so many people were still prescribing it for all these reasons that they all knew it wouldn't work. Meaning the responses were, yeah, we don't think it's going to work. Yeah, I'm going to prescribe it. And I think that just, which is, you know, obviously there's like, it's totally disconnected. And I think that what happened is in sort of the history of medicine, and even now, there's some things we just can't do anything about. And people, doctors included, are often very uncomfortable with the notion of 
there's nothing I can do. Like it is what it is, you know, let's hope for the best. And the people who are uncomfortable with that will say, okay, listen, I got to do something. So I'm going to prescribe bed rest or I'll give her this medication that I know doesn't work. She'll feel better about it. I'll feel better about it. You know, something bad happens. She won't blame herself. She won't blame me. Like whatever it is, there's something either overt or subconscious psychologically about the inability to just watch. And so, you know, but if you tell women this, like, like in women ask me, should I go on bed rest? I'll say, listen, there's no evidence that it does anything. I say, you know, the the studies aren't perfect. So do I think you should be training for an Ironman right now while you're in preterm labor? No. <laughs> they probably know. Yeah. I say like, I said, you know, you shouldn't be like running a marathon. I don't want you lying in bed all day. The The right answer is probably somewhere in the middle and no one knows exactly where in the middle. So I said, it depends. You know, if your activity causes you a lot of contractions, probably it's a good idea to back off and you feel perfectly fine. And then for you, it seems to be okay. And, you know, see how it unfolds over the course of time. But People get very like, you have to do this, you have to lie in bed. And then, you know, and there's downsides to that. People get blood clots, they get constipated, they get depressed, they can't work, you know, they need a babysitter. Like there's all these things that happen. And then when the baby's born, they're totally like wasted and emaciated. They can't take care right. of them. It's it's just a disaster sometimes. And it's still, still very common. And I, yeah. I can't, it's just, it's just unbelievable. I mean, I do I do wonder how much of this is a sort of like patient, patient push. Thing where like you know the patients re like they just really want you to do stuff and it's very hard to hear look there's nothing that we can we can do and this is something people have heard of seems like something that would you know like would like seems like it could be a good idea you know and then and then it's just rather than it's very tempting to just say you know you're right let's do that rather than you know fight with the patient about about this yeah i mean a lot of times i'll tell people no i'm fine and then they'll come back and say no nah, i was lying in bed all week and I'll listen if you want to like as long as you move around periodically it's like okay but it's just sometimes it's patient driven but there are doctors who either truly believe in it still or even if they don't believe in it they just think that from a practical perspective it's easier either for the patient or for them to just you know go along with the you know with the party line on this yeah, but it isn't the party line anymore, right? I mean, ACOG right. has been no, pretty, no, no, has no, sort of moved party. on this. Diff right? different, yeah, yeah, other different, different parties. Yeah. <laughs> different, party, different party. A different line. party. It's definitely a party line in the Google. I have found it in the Google. Right. So, you, you know, found Go it in the Google, Google is, is sometimes very, uh, very, oh my God. I had someone who asked me the other week. She said, I remember she called me and she said, you know, am I in labor? And I said, well, you know, no, you don't have any contractions and, you know, you don't feel anything. And, you know, your cervix was three centimeters, you know, yesterday and is three centimeters today. This is all from the office. And she goes, you know, but Google said I was in labor. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to take issue with Google on this one. I disagree. Maybe Google wants to deliver you. So <laughs> it was, it was just, I mean, listen, it happens. I don't care. Like it's got, people can look at Google and I don't, I don't get mad by it. It was just so funny. Oh my God. Google That's said funny. Google, Google said. Yeah. Well, said, all right. You know, and could then, be. <laughs> Well, and then you said that labor and delivery is a lot easier because the evidence is good. So I assume you meant things like like epidurals and, you know, uh, I don't know, induction or what, what. What were the issues that you found to be a little more straightforward? So I think, yeah, like the epidural evidence is, you know, relatively easy, easier to kind of to kind of understand because there is some randomized um, there is some randomized evidence. And because we kind of understand like things like, you know, what would be. There, there's a lot of sense in which like the the some of the risks are kind of like biologically deter like determined right so sort of if you understand you ask the question like well what is you know what is the risk of like what like what is the benefit okay right. so we know what the benefit is like that's not uh, like that's totally obvious you don't really need a randomized trial to know that it's good pain relief then we have these you know these other pieces of of kind of like well you know, would you get a fever? What, you know, do you get a fever? Do you shake? Like, there's a lot of these things where kind of we have some biological sense of why you would have those, why you would have those, those side effects. And then it just, it is, these are, you know, relatively straightforward things to run RCTs on, you know, something like epidural is a little tricky because you can't like really force people into different choices, but you can encourage them into different choices. And, you know, those kind of encouragement designs work, work well. And so I think there were a lot of things in birth like that, that just, it, it was just a bit easier to see because it was easier to read the data. Right. What are, you, what are your thoughts on birth plans? So I'm a bit of, of two minds on the birth plan. Um, so I had I had a birth plan. It's in the it's in the book. It has some bullet points. I do think it is it is valuable for people to kind of think through what they want. And you know there were some 
pieces of, you know, some pieces about like, do you want to have an epidural? Do you want to have, you know, do you want to be in a birthing, you know, is there a birthing center? What, like what, you know, this helps a way, it's a structured way to think through some options and, and decisions. I think where it becomes a problem or, you know, less helpful is when people get really wedded to like some very specific idea about how things are going to go without recognizing the sort of reality of, you know, birth is unpredictable and, you know, things happen that you weren't expecting. That's when you can, th- this can kind of get it cause more conflict than it, than it create than it, you know, eliminates. Right. I mean, do you get a lot of people asking you like, what should I put in my birth plan? Can I copy yours? Like things like oh, that. Yeah. People, a lot of people are just like, I copied your birth plan. It seemed fine. <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. I think my wife had a birth plan, which was, I want an epidural as soon as possible. And after that, I just want my husband to keep to, to shut up. And that's it. <laughs> and I think it worked, you know. Dude, well, yeah, as you see, you know, that feels like I feel like I would have had a hard time with my husband delivering on that. But uh, that's, yeah, <laughs> but yeah you know, it's interesting. Birth plans, a lot of doctors get like very offended by them. They're like, oh, you have a plan for your appendectomy. And they get all, you know, they get very like upset that someone have a birth plan. And you know, I get it. It is like you wouldn't walk into the dentist with like a list of like instructions right. of how Demand. to do things. And so, okay, like there's some there's something behind that. But I think that the idea is in, you know, in labor, there are a lot of things that are, you know, choices and preferences. And, you know, any good, you know, OB or midwife is going to be discussing these with women like the, the ease on do you want an epidural? Like it's very unusual that an OB would tell someone you must have an epidural or you can't have an epidural. I mean, it's very, very unusual thing to say. So it's it's the choice of her, the woman. So does it have to be written down? I want an epidural. I don't want an epidural. So I would say no. Like as long as you have a provider who you talk to and who will listen and you guys can have a conversation, it doesn't have to be written down. Might there be things that are valuable to write down because you you may forget about them because you're in labor, you know, things about, do you want the baby put on your chest right away? Do you want, right. you know, what do you, like things like that as a reminder. And I think that that makes a lot of sense, but I agree. Sometimes people get very detailed. Like I need the lighting at a certain level and I need this music playing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you can be there, but you have to keep your left hand behind your back. And you, it's like, it's all these strange things. And when I sometimes will, will tell them like, you know, this is, you know, we can try, but like, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Or, or you don't want to like put your you know, doctor or midwife in sort of in a position that he or she's uncomfortable with and not used to doing like if I want, you know, if it's like saying to my, you know, my plumber, I want you to come fix my washer, but I don't want you to use a wrench. And sort of like, well, like, but that's what I use. Like, no, it could be done without one and then they'll do it wrong. And so I think that there's, it's really about communication. And if the best way to communicate is to put something in writing and discuss it, great. If the best way to communicate is just to have a conversation, that's also great. I think these are things that should be discussed between the woman and her provider, but whether it needs to be written down or not, you know, whatever, yeah. if it's something she needs, great, but it's not something that has to be written down. Like we don't ask people to put a birth plan. We'll go over them if they have it. But otherwise, we talk about women with these about these decisions all the time, every labor. Yeah. And I think the other thing to, you know, that sort of like often when you get to the, to, by the time people get the second one, you kind of realize like just stuff is going to happen that you didn't like really and that that is hard to is hard to plan you know i had this whole plan with my second that was like we're gonna have the tub that was me like the tub but we got you know we got to the hospital i was like coming in the tub it's like the room with the tub we like made sure that we were like registered for the room with the tub whatever and then like you know the baby was born like 13 minutes after arrival at the hospital. So like I got in the tub and then I was like, it's coming out. And they were like, you can't have the baby in the tub. Like you gotta get out. We couldn't have filled the tub yet. It's dry. Right. No, exactly. The tub was like mostly filled. And I was like, okay, the baby's head. They were like, that's it. Get out of the tub. So uh, all in all, it was that I did not get to experience the tub like what, I had hoped. What What do you tell women? I'm sure a lot of people and they, they do, or they have been probably with Corona. What, what have you been telling people about home birth? There are some risks. Probably the most significant risk is that is that there's a reasonably high transfer rate. And so, you know, if you kind of if you are planning a home birth, you have to accept that, there, you know, that there's some, you know, c- good chance and depending where you are and who your provider is. And if you've had a baby before, you know, that that number is, is sort of variable, but there's, you know, not a non-trivial chance that you'll end up in a hospital anyway. And that's just something that people need to be to be prepared for. And that, you know, the evidence on kind of does it increase 
mortality for, you know, infant mortality or other complications, you know, th- that evidence is, is mixed. Some evidence is, is sort of scary. Some evidence is more, is more reassuring. And or I find this to be a difficult thing to, to kind of give people ad- advice on, because I think your, your, my baseline assumption is it has to be slightly more risky, but of course it also delivers some benefits, you know, for some people, they really want to be in their house and they under you know, they want that particular kind of kind of experience. I guess the main advice I would have, the main concrete advice is that, you know, you want like a very highly trained provider, a certified nurse midwife, not, you know, not somebody without significant training if you're going to go that route. Yeah. And I don't know how many of your listeners, you know, in terms of where they're asking from, but a lot of it also depends on sort of the the region and what the system is. I mean, if you live in, you know, in the UK, home birth is pretty common and pretty safe. And the data from there shows it's very safe because not only do they have good good people who are doing the deliveries at home, you know, in terms of the provider, they have a very tight system for what to do if things go wrong and the transfer has to be made. How is it going to be done? Where is it going to be done? When is it going to be done? Meaning, because that's fine. If you can get it all done very quickly, the likelihood of some disaster happening is very, 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 very low. But if you're just sort of winging it and say, hey, I'll just call 911 and see what happens, you know, you don't know when they're going to show up. You have no idea if the people who come in the ambulance will have know much about pregnancy. Where are they going to take you? They're not going to know who you are. They're going to have to like do all this paperwork to get you registered. The people there are going to be a little upset that there's a stranger showing up with a midwife who's, you know, it's, and that's when bad things happen. And so I would, you know, where, where, where I live, there isn't currently a great system for this. Maybe one day there will be, there are regions where it might be better. So I think that's another important thing. You know, how often is this done? What's the plan if something goes wrong? What hospital am I going to? How would I get there? And if the person's living at home says, oh, I don't know that's, I would shy away from that. If they're like, oh no, this is how we do it. Here's the protocol. It's written. This is what we do. This is a hospital I work with. And then there may be some risk, but it's much, much less, I would think. The other thing I would often tell people is, you know, try to figure out, is there an alternative that you kind of, that deliver some of the benefits of what you, you know, so like this great option that I was going to have this great tub situation that I didn't get to have with my second birth, like that, you know, this, like the hospital in Rhode Island that everyone gives birth at has these like alternative birthing centers, like rooms within the hospital where there's a giant bed, there's a tub, like, you, you know, you can't have any pain relief, but you know, it's kind of much closer to, to sort of like a home-like environment. Listen, this has been a fantastic review of sort of like the do's and don'ts in pregnancy. And, uh, you know, your book goes into all of these in much detail and, and more, obviously there's more topics and more details. And I, I have always, you know, recommended it. I think it's great for women who are pregnant, think of becoming pregnant, even just someone who had a baby wants to sort of go back and rethink it and sort of, oh, this is interesting. You know, I thought this, I thought this. And it's just because it's, it's a quick read because it's, it's not written by one of like me, like boring and stale and medical. It's written by like a, a real human, like who writes. And so it's, it's much more readable in that sense. And I'm, I'm curious for our listeners, like, you know, what's, what's the tease for, for the next edition in January? Like what's coming in there that we didn't have, or what could we look forward to? Two big things I added or pot and skincare. That's great. And I definitely we're, we're, we're going to talk also another time about the other book you wrote, at least on early parenting, which is Crib Sheet. And just again, for a teaser for our listeners, tell us a little bit about about that book. So Crib Sheet is, I mean, it's more or less a sequel. So the idea is to kind of like, like take the same, you know, use data to make decisions into the years of, of early parenting. The kind of difference there is that there are a lot of topics where really the data is where there isn't really a right thing to do. And so I think that, you know, that's also true in, in pregnancy, but in some sense it's even more true. You know, there's like, like some small risks or some small benefits. A lot of that book is really about helping people kind of think about, you know, what's going to like, what's going to work for you and your parenting and how can you be confident in the choices that you're making around things like, you know, circumcision or breastfeeding. Oh, breastfeeding. That won't be controversial at all. Yeah. No, 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 no one cares about that at all. No one's interested in that. No one's interested. And you have, now that your kids are aging, have you, uh, do you have a thought about writing a book about adolescence or teenager or what to do when your your daughter starts driving? Yes, exactly. Um, (laughs) How to be terrified. I feel like old (laughs) Older kids are, it's a, it's a little bit of a different, of a different ball game. So I've thought about that, but I think the, the question is, is exactly how to get, uh, how to write something that's, that would be useful for people when our kids are all so, when you so much of, of parenting in this slightly older age is really about, you know, parenting to your specific kid, which is a little less amenable to data. So we'll see. 
We'll see. Excellent. Emily, thank you so much for coming on. I, I always love talking to you. It's, uh, it's me too. It's yeah. great. And we're going to, we're going to, yeah, we're going to do this again. The books that we were talking about today, one is expecting better, which uh, has a new edition coming out in January crib sheet. You also have a website, which is I think Emily, Emily Oster.net. I believe. Yes, and, exactly. And, yeah. And you can sign up for your newsletter, which I read every time it comes out, although it's been a lot of Corona. I'm still a lot of Corona, <laughs> a lot of Corona. Thank you for still reading. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Excellent. We'll have a wonderful uh, day. Good luck. Right, Hope you this school year goes okay. Yeah. Great to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H E A L T H F U L W O M A N dot com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.